Welcome to my sewing room. I am so excited about our show today. We are going to present to you a wonderful technique which we have never had before on Martha's Sewing Room. It is called fabric stenciling. Margaret Boyles has shared with me some of her absolutely beautiful uh, stenciled and hand quilted quilts. This one features little lambs. And by the way, if you can notice the shading on the lambs, his little head is a little bit darker and his little feet are a little bit darker and the rest of him is really kind of light. What beautiful work, and by the way, the little lambs are hand quilted. The next quilt, which Margaret has shared with us, has beautiful traditional heirloom sewing techniques. There are two rows of gorgeous pink Nalona puffing at the top and around the sides, with entredeaux in between each one, and then absolutely magnificent pink bows that go the full length of the quilt. Once again, these are hand quilted. The last quilt Margaret has brought to share today is really interesting. This quilt is a traditional applique quilt that you usually see in a full-size quilt. Margaret has made it very small, has stenciled rather than appliqued, and of course has really reduced the size, and I just think this is very elegant. Won't you come with me over to the technique table and let's show you just exactly how to do fabric stenciling. I am so pleased to have Margaret Boyles as my guest today. Margaret has authored 25 books on needlework, including one book on fabric stenciling. Margaret, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thank you for letting me come back again and talk about something else that's fun for us to do, right? Oh, I cannot <laughs> wait. <laughs> fabric stenciling is not a new craft. Uh, there are wonderful 18th and 19th century quilts that are strictly American and uh, are stenciled on fabric. So we just have the advantage of having wonderful new materials and tools. I brought some wonderful stenciling brushes with me so that you can see. The stencil brush is a little bit different than, the, than an ordinary brush because it has a blunt end and it, you hold it so that this is perpendicular to your work. And I love them after they're used and the pigments stay in the bristles. It's always a natural bristle brush, which is very important. And they come in all kinds of sizes. This is a wonderful big one. This is for a wall, stenciling, and so forth. And we have paints that are liquid acrylic and crayons, which are really linseed oil and pigment and uh, oil uh, turpentine in a, in a little crayon. And then we have uh, stencil cream, which always reminds me of lip gloss, and it, it's wonderful to use because these new paints are formulated so they won't run underneath the edge of the stencil and make a mess. And then <coughs> the next tool you're going to need is a good craft knife to cut your stencils with. This one's old, but they're very inexpensive. I, I think I've had this one about 30 years. And I, I always buy my blades in a little package like this where the new ones are on top, and you put the old one inside so that when you dispose of them, it's safe. Now, could you tell me who really does, I don't know about where to buy this. Where, where do you buy paints like this, Margaret? Uh, those any, cra any craft store. Any craft, any store. craft okay. store. Then you need a mat, definitely need a mat. Now you can, if you uh, want to, use your rotary cutting mat, but they're usually a little bit big. Mine is a little piece of uh, office supply rubber uh, desk protector. It's self-healing and I like it because I will, as you'll see, I will turn it as I'm working. If you don't want to invest in that, a good heavy piece of cardboard or chipboard is a good investment and very inexpensive. To, to begin, you trace your design onto stencil film and when you pick up your stencil film, which incidentally you can buy either by the sheet or a package, one side is very shiny and one side is uh, frosted looking. And the shiny side is the right side. Put that, we'll use that one up. Trace the stencil design that you're going to use onto the film using a, uh, a technical pen or a pen that has ink in it that's formulated so it will stay on film. Then just take, simply take your knife and put, cut right on the line and I turn either my film or the mat depending on what I'm working on. Try to stay on the line. When I get the areas like that I just pull the pen After you finish cutting and take out your little piece, if there's any ink on the edges, 
sponge that off with a little bit of uh, water on a paper towel because that little black will transfer to your fabric with your paint when you start painting and you don't certainly don't want to mix in any black ink in with your paint. Then to start, I usually protect my table with a either a piece of paper. I've just got a nice thick paper towel under this piece today. Now you notice that when I was doing the stencil design it had a square around it and I didn't bother with the square, I just left it. The pattern for the quilt has a grid, a three inch grid, and in order to center your your hearts, all you have to do is match your square to the to the heart, to the outline. Now the pencil, the uh, crayon is used a little bit differently than traditional paint. You just go around the outside edges on the stencil itself, not putting any paint on the fabric at this point. And then take your stencil brush and pull the paint from the stencil into the fabric area. Working, you work in a circular motion, and you see by working more heavily at the outside edges, I have a shaded heart. Oh, Margaret, that is so pretty. <laughs> it comes out so, it's so easy to do and so fast. The, to me, the hardest part is getting the, the stencil designed and cut. After that's done, it's just repetition. Now, oh, well, that is so beautiful, the way it's shaded on this. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, it really, really is. I really fact, love it. That looks almost too easy. There's a... <laughs> In the 18th century, the stencils were actually cut out of copper, and one, one famous itinerant stencil uh, uh, artist's toolbox has actually survived. I have a cat stenciled in my, on my back stairs of my house named Moses in honor of that man. <laughs> now, this little pillow is a little bit more uh, complicated. It's not just one simple uh, stencil. This pillow, incidentally, has been stenciled but not quilted. This one requires two stencils for the bows and then uh, several more for each of the of the birds and so forth. But I want to show you how to do a, a stencil that takes two stencils. That like, bow is so like fascinating to me. Is that what you're going to show us? That's what I'm going to show oh, you how to do. So the bow takes two stencils. Because if, if you look at this again, you will see that if these if this was all cut of one stent, uh, stencil film, it would just fall apart. You just couldn't control it. It would just fall apart. So you have to do two, two stencils for that. And I've done that here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it in pink. Go around my edges. So you always go, if you, if you use that pen, the, do you always go, the with crayon? With the crayon, you do it on the film okay, like okay. this. Now with the paint, you just put it on the inside area like you like remember when we used to do stencils when we were little kids and do letters and so forth. We just put it on the inside. Well now we with this crayon. I love this crayon. Incidentally, these also clean up with soap and water or this wonderful brush cleaner. So it's not really a big project doing it. Margaret, how permanent are these stencils as far as washing and? I was going to get to that. Okay. Um, match your paint to your fabric and look at the labels because they will tell you that this one's good on polyester cotton blends or this one's better on all polyester or this one's better on on uh, uh, all cotton and look for a, a fairly fine thread count because the finer the thread count the more even your edges will be. Now I've finished doing that part of the bow and follow the instructions carefully for uh, curing and so forth. This particular crayon, you wait 24 hours and then uh, iron it with a pressing cloth to set it and then they tell you to wait a certain period of time before you actually wash it. But they are washable. Did you ever try to get, take paint out of a shirt that you didn't want a paint spot on? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, and you know, I never got the paint out. That's the reason I was asking you. Yeah, these, these, these are fairly permanent. And, uh, Margaret, it looks so fast, too. Is that, it is I guess fast. that's one of the beauties. Yeah. And those wonderful quilts that you did. Oh, And beautiful. you can just shade to uh, make, give it definition by working more heavily in one area and leaving little areas lighter. And there we have a stenciled bow. 
Oh, my goodness. Oh, Margaret, that, that is so beautiful. It's fun. You and I love the idea of the little crayon. Of course, I would love to see those paints in operation, too. This is just more fun, well, isn't we, it? Should we get the paint out? <laughs> if we had time, we would. <laughs> Margaret, thank you so yeah. much. And, you know, I have asked Margaret, the, these beautiful quilts that I showed you at the beginning of the show, actually, I've asked Margaret to show us how you put one of those quilts together. Because now stenciling is one thing, but making it into one of the Margaret Boyle's quilt is another. Margaret, would you please go over to the technique boards and share with us how you put one of these quilts I together? I would love to. This quilt called Martha's Little Angel is a doll quilt. It's a wonderful first project for a, a new stenciler or a new machine quilter. It's made of a beautiful quality of cotton muslin stenciled with a stencil crayon trimmed with eyelet beading with a pink ribbon run through it that matches the fabric and wonderful Swiss eyelet. It's quilted, what we call outline quilting, It's right around the heart and on the long lines of the grid, which I'm going to show you in a minute, and then quilted once inside each square. There's not a lot of work. It's very fast, a wonderful little thing to make. The first step is to mark your grid on your piece of fabric Wash the fabric first so that it will take the stencil paint. Mark your grid, stencil, and move to the next project, which is attaching the beading. Now, the secret of having the beading look pretty is to put the ribbon through it first. Then it will turn the corners nicely. You can make nice little miters down at the corners. Then layer the top, the quilt batting, and the backing together. Smooth them out. And on a little project like this, it's perfectly okay to use straight pins to pin it together. Bigger projects, you're going to be, want to be much more secure and have safety pins or, or the quilt clips. Pin it together, and you're ready to go on and to get ready to machine quilt. After, I'm going to show you machine quilting in just a minute, but I thought I'd go right through this to the next stitch, step here. This piece has been quilted, and your eyelet is on the edges. Then gather the ruffle. And the ruffle attaches just to the top. Just hold the backing and the batting out of the way. Gather your ruffle, attach it to the top, and then turn the raw edges to the inside. Your ruffle will come up like this, and the raw edges, and just whip it together on the back, and you have a finished quilt. All you have to do is add a pretty bow. Now I'm going to go over to the machine and show you how to quilt on the machine, which is fun and fast. No more spending 200 hours at it. You can finish this in one evening if you, if you are inclined to do so. I like to use 100% cotton thread, a 50 weight, and one thing that's absolutely critical for machine stitching is that you have what's called a walking foot, which speeds the fabric through at the top and the bottom at the same speed. This machine already has one installed as part of the machine, so I don't have to worry about that. To outline quilt, just go right around. You want to use your needle down position and just right around the edge. That's straight stitch. About what length is that? Margaret? This is a three millimeter length, okay. and I'm putting the stitching onto the white right at the edge of the pink rather than on the pink itself. Just stitch to the end. Now, some quilters uh, start out with two or three very small stitches at the beginning and end with the same and just cut off the ends. But I prefer to pull them through to the back, tie them in a knot, and then just bury them inside the quilt in the filler and cut off the ends and they're, it's a much prettier finish. It's a little bit more work, but it's a much prettier finish. Basically, that's machine quilting. Uh, three millimeter stitch length is really a, a perfect one for it. Your straight stitching is just a quarter of an inch from the edges. If you will do the, the two, the long pieces that stabilize it first. You can just go as fast as you can go. And you just trace those little lines off mm -hmm. with a magic purple pen or blue pen. Mm -hmm. okay. And I did them by dots, so there's not that much to, 
to uh, Well, you know, Margaret, out. that's absolutely fascinating. You go through all three layers there, the batting mm -hmm. and the, the backing and the front of the quilt. Right. Margaret, that is absolutely fascinating. Fun. Won't you stay with <laughs> us and enjoy making a wonderful treasures pillow that I think your children and grandchildren will really like. I have a really interesting pillow for you called a treasures pillow and we're going to show a little bit about how to construct it but also there's a really neat technique called corded satin stitch that is really easy and it looks really hard so if you're like I am you're probably going to enjoy learning that. Here is the treasures pillow done out of silk dupioni. You see it says treasures written across the top and there's this wonderful little bag right here that actually is stitched to the pillow and you can untie the little cord and pull your treasures out of here. You can put any treasures that you want to keep and this pillow would be really nice for almost any room in your house. The pillow is really basic square pillow construction. This shiny pleated fabric is really a neat one for home decorating too. And to make the ruffle, you simply fold two rows over, excuse me, the rows over and then treat it like a pillow ruffle. To make the little bag, I make two bags, one out of the pleated fabric and one out of the Ecru Silk Dupioni. Then I stitch the two bags together all the way around. And to make the little lined bag, I'll leave enough of an opening. I will turn it right side out, and this won't take too long to do either. Turn it right side out, and now my little bag is, is basically finished. For a little bit of trim on the bag, I will take a little bit of uh, purchase trim and zigzag it or straight stitch it around the top and then you attach it to your pillow and tie the little corded tie. Now to make the corded applique, uh, corded satin stitch rather not corded applique, I'm going to use a top stitch needle size 80 that has a little bit bigger hole. I have run two colors of thread through, the uh, burgundy color and the ecru color to stitch on this uh, silk dupioni. Now first of all you're going to trace off or rather draw out your T-R-E-A-S-U-R-E-S. -E -E Just draw it out in pencil, whatever word you would like to put on this pillow. I'm using an, uh, an applique foot and I'm working over, cor over gimp cord and then I'm simply going to zigzag and believe it or not this is not hard to do. When I do this uh, corded satin stitch though I am going to hold the cord, the gimp cord up just a little bit. Now let me stop here and tell you exactly what I have now is a 0.35 length and a 1.5 width. Okay, I'm simply doing a zigzag. I hold the cord up a little bit. I'm going to control it. I'm going to simply go along and then if I need to make a curve I will just simply pull it around in the curve and this is called corded satin stitch and it really makes a beautiful stitch if you want to do some writing on a pillow. All right, wasn't that fun and easy? Absolutely anybody can do it. And here is the finished version of the little treasures pillow with my corded satin stitch on the top. And now I would like to share with you one of the most beautiful ladies' vests that I have ever seen and show you how easy it is to make. The pattern for this series is a series of absolutely beautiful women's vests. This is one of them. This vest goes uh, is a very long vest and we have long and medium and short so you can make this lace vest any length you wanted to. It's simply a collage of laces and I'm going to turn it around to show you how pretty it is on the back too. This is um, a wonderful uh, uh, handkerchief and then there's more netting and beading with ribbon run through it. Now how do you make one of these vests? I've told you it's easy but let me share it with you. First of all I'm going to trace the vest pattern off on a piece of netting. Then I'm going to begin to place my laces. I said collage, that's kind of what it reminds me of. Collage style, I'll fold it and if I need to move it around, I'll fold a little dart in and then I'll put pieces and strips of any kinds of, of beautiful things I have. You can use antique lace or you can use new lace. You can use anything you have that you want to put on your vest. Then after I begin to have it look like a vest and begin to have the little holes filled in, I will come in on the armhole curve and I will put a piece of lace edging. I'll have to slip that one down just a little bit following the armhole curve and that will finish that off. And as you can see, this scalloped edge will finish off the inside. Now let me just share with you a couple of techniques. 
In order to keep your machine from eating the lace, on some machines anyway, you do need a stabilizer. I think it's easy to work with a water-soluble stabilizer when you're using laces. All right, for instance, here I have butted these two pieces of lace together, zigzagged them together, and this is a water-soluble stabilizer. Okay, before I dip it into the water to make it go away, I'm going to first of all trim off, but be careful and don't cut your lace. I'm going to go ahead and trim off the excess water soluble stabilizer. Then I have a bowl of water here. I will simply dip it in the water and let it stay just a minute and then it will simply go away. It becomes sort of like jelly if you want to know the truth. Okay, it's all beginning to go away now. Then I will pull it out and see you don't have to tear that paper for a paper stabilizer and have those little fuzzies where you can see it when you're working on lace. And then lay it there to dry. Now I've, I've showed you a little bit about zigzagging the lace edging down uh, to the armhole curve and I've already done a little bit of it here but let me just do a little zigzag. Let's come on around and finish this up. Around on the armhole curve I'm stitching the lace edging down. I have my water soluble stabilizer underneath it. All right, I'm gonna come all the way around here on the armhole curve, zig and zag. And by the way, I have the length on 1.5 and the width on 2.5. All right, I'm gonna zigzag on around here. And then after I finish it, I'm gonna trim away all of the excess laces and everything that's right underneath there, okay. I'm going to pull it out and then I'll get my trusty scissors and come in here, pretend like it's all finished. Actually, I have a little bit more sewing to do, but I will hold this back and go ahead and trim away all of the excess laces from behind there along with the water soluble stabilizer. Now, won't you come along with me to my attic? This is an absolutely magnificent dress. I think the date would be 1910 to 1920 or 1925. It reminded me of that lovely vest we made a few minutes ago. It's embroidery on netting. And you know, before I go down and actually show you the embroidery on the dress, I'd like to show you this really interesting split sleeve, the pretty lace, and this is uh, machine hem stitching on the actual old hem stitchers that attaches the lace. Now, if you will just take a really wonderful look at this magnificent embroidery that goes down on top of the lace and all the way down to the skirt. I'll tell you what, somebody either spent a lot of time or else I'm having a hard time telling if it were, if it were made on a Swiss machine. It's a beautiful drop-waisted style and you know, you just don't find embroidery like that anymore except in these wonderful antique clothes. For our Sewing from the Heart segment today, I have a really nice letter from Nikki Wells from Homer, Alaska. Dear Martha, during the summer of 1994, I did my clinical pastoral education at Wesley Hospital, Wichita, Kansas. This was a requirement for being a lay hospital chaplain. While there, I was impressed by a group of ladies who make gowns for the babies that are stillborn. Most of these gowns are doll size, very plain, but it helps the parents who lose a dear little one to be able to hold it and see it dressed in something beautiful that is the right size. This is truly a gift of love to parents who are grieving. I'm sorry that I don't know the names of these ladies, but I have seen the works of their labor and do know how they make a difference in a time of sorrow. Joyfully, Nikki Wells. Well, Nikki, I think that this sewing uh, gowns for the babies in the hospital is one of the most beloved uh, volunteer sewing pastimes of women who love to sew and who love to reach out and do things for other people also. As a matter of fact, those of you that are watching today that say, well, I don't have any babies to sew for anymore. Yes, you do. You have babies all around you and children in foster homes. Believe me, if you have a sewing machine and a little bit of extra time and the desire, I promise you there are lots of babies and children that would really appreciate your sewing. Thank you for coming to visit me in my sewing room today, and I'd like to invite you to come again next time. Mm -hmm.